welcome to the Garden Railway. And we're all up and running, and it's jolly exciting. But at the moment, our Garden Railway is something rather ordinary. And I think we'd like to turn it into something extraordinary. And over the next few programmes, we'll be showing you how to do that. Let's start with this. Now, this is a very nice model that my uncle bought way back in the early 70s from a shop in High Holborn, as it happens. But beautiful model though this is, for some people, it's not quite good enough. This is just part of a vast collection created by a model maker extraordinaire. They look as though they were bought in the shops, but in fact they were created by the fair hand of Michael Adamson. That's you. In you come, in you come, in you come. <laughs> No, right. well, you know, this is just fantastic, unbelievable. You know, how long have you been doing this? Well, 20 years. I started in about 1980. And I started with colonial outline trains because I couldn't buy large English outline trains at that time. And so I went colonial, African, South African, Rhodesian, etc. Are they all from kits? No, a lot of them are scratch built. The coaches and the loco and that are scratch built. So when you say scratch built, what do you mean? When we say scratch built, in the case of these coaches, we're talking about a sheet of plastic, a knife, and you start cutting. Well, uh, you know, how do you how do you know you know how much to cut? What what do you work <laughs> from? What do you do? Well, what you do is you start off with a drawing. Uh, you transcribe that drawing onto a sheet of plastic and then you get a scalpel and a straight edge and you cut. Yeah, I and mean, there is some absolutely marvellous detailing here. For instance, in these Great Western Rail cars here, you, you know, the, the right. material on the seats. The material is actually an old shirt and uh, I wanted to, to replicate a moquette. You remember the old moquettes in the mm -hmm. old days they used to have in drawing rooms and, and in railway seating, upholstery, etc. And a very fine check is what it's all about. A shirt or similar material will give you that type of thing. What to you is the attraction of modelling? I think in the early days when we were doing the scratch building, I got a great kick out of finding all sorts of odd shaped items. I mean, I'm a pharmacist by profession. I was surrounded by all sorts of funny shaped bottles and tops and God knows what, and it sourced an awful lot of material. If we looked at an engine, I could go around it and I could say that came from so-and-so, etc. And it, you, you did get an awful lot of satisfaction from building a model out of virtually nothing. Nowadays, of course, the hobby is much better served, you've got more kits around, and really it is much easier. It scares me a little bit. Because now I can't do it, or can I? What, what, how, how do I begin, really? Uh, I think uh, you have to have a mindset in that you've got to have a desire to want to create things with your own hands. I think that's important. Uh, having said that, there are all sorts of levels of model making that one can aspire to. I'd say but, my level is completely basic. Well, if, you, if you're basic, you're probably going to start off with a simple kit, say, of wood, plastic and the like. The beauty of plastics is that they can be glued together relatively easily. That's a plastic kit there, no, is it? No, that, is, that isn't a plastic oh. kit. This is a new type of material, relatively new. This is resin. Right. Resin is very similar to plastics. It gives you a nice lot of detail. So this this piece here has been moulded like this. Yes. And would I be correct in saying that what I need to do now, if I were to go this route, is add details to it? Yes. Like uh, handles maybe on the doors yeah. here. I mean, if, if you've got, uh, you know, a detailing pack, for, say, for one of these containers, you would have chains and shackles. To give you an idea. There we have... Really? Is that, is that possible? That is, is that... the same container that you see there. Right. And you've got all these detailing parts added. Yeah. And of course it's been painted and you've got the decals oh, on I see, it. the Water chains slide, there. The chains and all this sort of thing. And now, little details yes, across little the little details. Roof. They're just bits of wire, um, chain, pair of couplings, etc. Does, um, does kit bashing mean anything to you? Oh yes. Should I kit, look towards that yes. as something to do? Kit bashing is a form of kit building, really, uh, but it takes 
a ready-built proprietary product like right. this, right. Uh, which is a typical European van, yeah. complete with couplings and wheels, the lot. You right. can plonk it on the track. I mean, that costs you about £20. Right. And you can then take a simple um, plastic conversion kit, yeah. which consists of bits of cut plastic, yeah. uh, some vacuum formings like this, some new end bits, some extra handrails, a few details like the vents, the steps, bits of wire for handrails. So and is that, is that, that, is that like transfer, transforms into that. And that is a typical British outline, freelance, Guard. narrow gauge guards van. Very nice. I like that. And I think I could do something. You know, like you're that. talking about ten pound. And again, my it. skills here are the ability to stick things on, perhaps. Yes, stick things on. Maybe cut a few things out. Yes, you can cut bits out if you don't like. The painting is very simple. We right. don't use a brush on that. We use car paints. So that's kit bashing. Yes. Uh, do you know something that really scares me, and that's soldering. Soldering. Uh, I don't know why it scares me. It just does. What? It just. It's... What is solder for a start? Right. Solder is comes in a reel like that. You can get all different uh, solder at different melting points. Really? But I just buy the normal uh, multi-core solder which has got a resin flux in it. I may very well use extra flux depending on what I'm going to do. What is flux? Put it this way, if you try and solder without flux it won't work. To just try and do it on its own you, you tend to get very blobby results and it, it doesn't work very well. Whereas if you put a, a little bit of flux onto the work, take your iron and the solder and apply it and the solder flows. The secret of soldering is to get the work hot. Right. If you don't get it hot, it won't flow properly. Right. And then you get the thing called a dry joint happening. I actually think I suffer from dry joints naturally. <laughs> Can we see a bit of soldering? Yes, I should think so. Uh, I've okay. already done quite a lot of work on this Great. particular wagon. Yeah. And this is brass, isn't it? This is brass. And what we're going what I was proposing to show you was these little things here. We go right. like that and like that. Well, this is part of a kit. Right. For a gauge three wagon. Right. It's been what we call chemically milled. Right. Uh, it's a photo etching process and all the parts come in sheet form like this and you just take them out, bend them, solder them up and you end up with the wagon like so. Okay. Would I be right in saying that the secret to model making is in the detailing? Oh yes. Would that be right? Detailing takes a considerable part of the time taken to produce a good model. Right. No doubt about it. Um, in fact, if you have models produced commercially, this is where all the labour comes in, is in the detail. The more detail you have, the more money it costs. Now, all I've done here is just trim this little uh, bracket. Yeah. I'm going to bend it literally in my fingers like so. Yeah. And that is going to be soldered into place on the sold bar. And then we slot that into the beam like so. And I'm holding it with my finger at the moment, yeah. just to give you an idea. Well, now, that's easy that, enough, is that it? That is, no, 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 oh. no, no, no. That's the oh. easy part. Oh, right. <laughs> what we've got to do now is solder that to that. And as I said earlier, the main thing is to get the work hot. Hot, mm -hmm. hot, hot yeah. is the key You've to soldering. You've got to have a decent sized soldering iron yeah. for the work involved. That's a 60 watt soldering iron. So Ooh. a lot of people Ooh. have, say, 25 watt irons. They're no, not probably pathetic. good enough yeah, for no. this job. No, I so always what, thought that. What we're going to do is we're going to apply a bit of flux, first of all, to that yeah. tab there. We're going to take the iron. Yeah. And it's almost like do you know, I really it. genuinely wouldn't have a clue how to do this. Right, we've got to tin the iron. First of all. What's that, cover it in solder? Yes. Yeah. You tin it. Um, actually, this, this process is tinning of the work. I'm actually just putting some tinning on the work like so. That's all I'm doing. I'm just yeah. coating it like that. Yeah. And then put that in there. Yeah. Take a bit more flux. Yeah. Put it on there. Okay. Like so. Right. If we do that, yeah. you can see how now that's that's now 
soldered quite nicely like that. The solder has flowed and the bracket is fixed. Oh, you've done it? Yeah. That was it? That was it. Oh, is that it? I thought it was now, a lot more to you it. Know, when, it, when the work is small, <laughs> yeah. it is easier. When yeah. you've got large lumps of metal, right. then you're going to need something like this, which is a little blowtorch. For larger lumps of metal, we merely turn it on like so, fire it, and now that will heat up lumps of metal. Say, something like this, bigger, where you're, you're taking two lots of metal together, 28 right. thou, and you would apply that like so, like that. First of all, of course, you must tin the metal. That is, you use your ordinary iron, Absolutely. and you tin the side of the metal like so, right. with your flux yeah. and your solder. Do you use a larger soldering iron than that? Yes, you can, just to show you what we mean in the drawer here. Right. There's a good example. Yeah. You can see what we mean about the size of the heads. Right. That's 120 watts. That's a big That's boy. 60 watts. Yeah. That's um, the one I want. You see? And, you know, that is a bigger iron that I use for metal yeah. work. If you want a very big iron, then in here we have the one that we use for the track work. Yeah. That's equivalent to 150 watts. That's well, gas powered. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the one I want now, actually. Forget the other two. They're nothing. <laughs> that's the one I want. Hello and welcome back to some stunning models in the first part of the programme by Mike Adamson and all of those models were scratch built, not even from kits. Now I'd love to have a go at doing that but with my level of skills, could I hope to achieve something as stunning as this? No, not really. But while I have a think about what I could hope to achieve, why don't you have a look at this? My name is David Hampshire and the railway is called Grandad's Garden Railway, the name given to it by my grandchildren. The circuit consisted originally of an out and back circuit from the conservatory to the bottom of the garden. The trains were powered by a pickup from the track, but later, because I wanted to visit other people's tracks, this was converted to battery and radio controlled. Later on, I decided to try and invite other people to my garden and realised that if we were going to run steam engines, we needed a continuous circuit. So a continuous circuit was added to the out and the back circuit. And in this last couple of years, this has actually been extended to the entire garden. I don't find this an intrusion in the garden because it's given me a challenge I love collecting plants, so every new bit of railway is um, an opportunity to find something new that I can put in, in a new situation. Well, when we started the railway, the garden was really just a, a grass play space for the children. But as we've extended it, and the children have used the garden less, I've been able to use each piece of the railway as an excuse and an opportunity for planting in different ways. For example, where we've got a stream, it gets a lot of sunshine, so I've used alpines. The, the latest loop, we've got a double track running across the lawn, was very obtrusive, so we've put slabs down on either side and incorporated it in a rather drier garden that makes the railway itself less obvious. And I've used the viaduct on the far side as an opportunity for higher planting. This was one of the first projects was to build the Trestle Bridge to enable the trains to leave the conservatory and go into the garden without the garden coming right up to the conservatory. And it's simply a series of pieces of wood rather held together by small nails. The building, the first building, is based on the West Highland line stations. It's constructed out of wood with a felt roof uh, so that it can remain outdoors all year round. The other buildings are jigstone which are built from individual stones or blocks of stones right, glued together and again with a felt roof to protect them from the weather. It's very important if you want to use your railway to have it ready to run at any one time. My wagons are stored permanently in the conservatory and I simply add the engines, switch them on and I can run straight out onto the track. It's another fantastic railway. Can we keep them coming? Yes, we can. Now, what that particular railway has done is given me time to think of something to model. Now, the old water feature, the harbour, 
What that needs is a boat. Now, we've had a few problems finding boats in this particular scale, but I think we've done it. Voila! Here it is. It is a child's plastic boat, and it cost two pounds, all right? Now, I know you may be mocking me. Would you do that? But see this boat through my eyes. This is gonna be a little coastal tramp steamer. One of those dirty, grubby little boats that makes its way around the ports of Great Britain. And it's gonna pick up saffron in our port. How's it gonna do it? Well, I have been collecting since the start of the series, little bits and bobs. And now's the time I feel to make use of them. For instance, how about this? Now, this is a window frame from a model house, all right, which I've transformed into the hatch covers of my little steamer, all right? And I'm gonna fill those with little mounds of saffron. Thinking about how to do that, I'm probably gonna use powder paint and cement mixed up. We'll see how that goes. Now, this is chain, ordinary chain from, I think this is from an old watch as it happens. And that's just gonna be piled up in the corner here. Obviously, I wanna paint all this before I really stick anything on. This is a little offcut from a wagon that I amended the design of for the railway and has now been pressed into service as our little satellite navigation radar housing unit. This ear is the end of a clothesline. And I think if I cut this at the end so, that could be quite a nice bumper round here. This is the bit I'm most excited about. This is an earplug. It's one of those things that you put in your lug out when you're operating heavy machinery. But look at it this way, and that's a very nice little fender. All right. Uh, finally, I'm just going to start work. Notice how it all splits up, very useful for me. I'm just gonna start work on this and I've already pre-cut a little bit of plastic card there, which I'm gonna stick on uh, using this polystyrene cement, okay? And I'm doing this before I paint the actual wheelhouse, just so I can give a bit of relief to it there. You can imagine that, hopefully, as a door once it's all painted. Now, this is plastic card. It costs about 60p a sheet, okay? And this is the size that it comes in. And you can simply, by using a blade, and a little bit of wood here, cut yourself very easily, whatever you desire. My name's Robin Palmer. I named the railway uh, after the place Wimbish, so this becomes the Wimbish Light Railway. We've got four steam locomotives and two electric. The first locomotive was Little Nell, as we affectionately call her, a Great Eastern 044 tank engine made by George Woodcock. A couple of years later, we found another one made by the same man, and that's Lynn, an American 242. I then found the engine which is now named Little David, which is a Royal Scott class 6135. The large battery electric is based on a Swedish Railways RC10 locomotive. The largest engine on the railway is the Royal Scott 6100, and this is an engine designed by Henry Greenley, who worked for Bassett Lope, the famous Northamptonshire company. A lot of uh, these Bassett Lope engines were built because Bassett Lo offered a set of plans and castings for people to build their own engine. Well, uh, our grounds are nearly eight acres and the railway is nearly three quarters of a mile long in terms of footage of track, but in terms of uh, route availability it's much longer. I've never actually calculated the actual running distance because of the complication of running in different directions round the loop and round the triangle it probably works out to more like a mile and a half well the signal box is a bit of a, a passion really I did look round to buy a signal box off British Rail and they offered me one for a pound unfortunately it 
it comprised of a huge box next to Plumpton Racecourse and it would have cost many tens of thousands to move it and it would have been totally out of scale with the railway. So in the end I opted to build a half size box based broadly on Great Eastern designs. This box is operated uh, by a lever frame which actually came out of uh, Crew North signal box although everything after the lever frame is very much 21st century involving electronics and ethernet signalling. The position of every train can be found on a, uh, an animated diagram. The railway is largely run just for private enjoyment but from time to time we get groups of visiting parties of people who ask to come and see the railway and we're always glad to have visitors and be able to run it properly uh, for people who come along. Welcome to the water feature part of the garden here, perhaps unique amongst garden railways in that there's no water in it whatsoever, merely a football. And this entire situation is being created by my two-year-old son, Freddie. Thanks very much, Freddie, for the spike incident. So somewhere in there, there's a puncture to find, but on a more positive note, the model boat. Hopefully not looking too plasticky anymore. I've put some enamel paint on it and dirted the whole thing up using a bit of cement dust. I think the most pleasing bit for me are the windows, strangely. I created that out of a bit of plastic card stuck on the inside with some glue. And the circle that all these little boats seem to have was created from a sawn off bit of a felt tip pen stuck on with a little bit of glue. That tarpaulin, by the way, uh, that's just a bit of silver foil that's been painted black. And I think it looks quite nice, actually, sat on the quay side there. And also, on quite a positive note, while we're about it, I've put some lights in on the harbour here. Uh, these are sold separately as kits, and I've stuck them onto the rocks here using a bit of that filler that you can use on your car. It sets very rapidly indeed. And I've connected them using very thin copper wire. Hopefully in time that will turn green and disappear from view and the whole thing should weather in quite nicely. <laughs>